Hey guys, I'm Chili. Welcome back to part 3 of tutorial 4. This is the last part of tutorial 4. Almost done. Uh, now, what are we doing today? Well, I mentioned in part 1 that this is actually a remake of the original tutorial 4. Tutorial 4 was originally much shorter, and it ended up, you know, dropping a lot of people out of this series. Uh, now, for the homework for tutorial 4, original tutorial 4, uh, a lot of people were having trouble with it. It was, it was quite difficult tasks that I gave them. So what I'm going to do in this version is I'm just going to go over what I gave for homework in the previous version. And I'm not going to give it for homework because it fucked over a lot of people. But I still have to show it because the, the tutorials that follow these ones, they kind of assume that you have this code already built into your, uh, into your code base. So I can't just skip it altogether. I've got to do something. So instead of giving it to you for homework, I'm just going to go over it with you in a tutorial video. So there were three tasks that were given. The first one was separate the drawing code from the game logic. Uh, the second task is to control the reticle velocity instead of the movement. And what this means is, right now, if you push the left button, it moves left. If you release the left button, it stops. But what we want to have is we want to have you push the left button, it starts moving left. And if you release the left button, it still moves left. Uh, until you push the right button, and then it'll stop, and then it'll start moving this way. Or So, basically, the reticle is going to be moving whether you press the buttons or not, depending on what velocity it has. Uh, I'll get into that. I'll show you what I mean when we get to that. And the third part is prevent the reticle from balling out of control. Because if you hold down, if, when we're controlling the velocity, if you hold down the key for too long, it's going to speed up really quick. It's going to go bam off the side of the screen. It's going to crash your program. So I'll show you a little technique for preventing that. So there's the three topics. So first, separating drawing code from game logic. What does that mean? Well, let's go, uh, let's go, let's go to game.h. And you'll see here that in these uh, functions here, we've got the compose frame function, and that's the one that we've been writing all our code in so far. But then we also have this update model function. Now, what does that one do? Well, here it is. Currently, it has nothing in it, so it's empty function, does, takes no actions. Uh, if we look at game.go, this is the function that describes what happens every frame. We see that we update the model, and then we compose a frame, and then we end the frame, which basically means we show that composed frame to the user, and then we do it all over again. So, the idea here, and this is very common in games, is we want to separate the game logic from the actual drawing operations. And I get this question often, like, Chili, why do I have to do this? I don't want to do this. Let me, it's easy to just put it all in the same place. Let me put it in the same place. But no, that's not how we do it. And there are tons of good reasons for this. They're, they're complicated, have to do with architecture. But let me give you a simple example. So there's a game called Factorio. And in it, you build a big factory and you, you fight aliens. And it's, it's good fun bullshit. Now, it's a multiplayer game. You can have multiple players connect to each other. One player's computer serves as the server and all the other players connect to it, and that's fine. But sometimes you don't want to have one of the players as the server. You want to have a dedicated server. So you have one machine that runs the game, but no one's playing on it. There's no user interacting with it. It's just running the simulation, and then all the other users connect to that dedicated server. Now, here's the thing. When you have a dedicated server like that, you don't want to be drawing all the graphics, because that's just a waste of CPU power. Think about it. There's no one playing the game on that machine. It's just, it's just a server. It's running a simulation, and it's communicating with all the other clients. It doesn't need to draw that shit onto the screen. But... If you write your code so that all the game logic and all all the king's horses and all the king's men, no, all the game logic and all the drawing code are mixed up together, you can't separate them, and now your server has to draw that shit even though no one's watching. It's bullshit. But if you take all the game logic and you jam it into a separate function, you have your update model function and you have your compose frame function, then when you're playing the game on a client with a human interacting with it, 
you update the model and then you compose frame. But when you're running it on the server, all you do is you just disable this function call. You don't draw the shit. You update the model, you run the simulation, but you just skip the drawing. And you can do this because you've separated that shit out. That's just one example of why it's a good idea to separate your game logic from your drawing code. There are many other reasons, but I'm not going to go into that shit right now. I just say, do it because I fucking told you to, bitch. So how do we separate our game logic from our, uh, our game logic and our input from our drawing code. Well, I mean, all this stuff here, this isn't drawing shit. So that's, it's gotta be game logic. So let's just take it and let's cut it out from here. And we'll paste that into here. So here we go. Here's where we're setting the position or updating the position of the, uh, the reticle based on what keys are being pressed here we're setting the color now this is a problem obviously because this is a local variable so we call update model that's going to set this variable depending on you know whether control is being pressed but that variable will be destroyed at the end of this function and there'll be no way for compose frame to get that information see compose frame is like what the fuck is a gb I don't know, I don't even. So what you gotta do is first of all, very important, get rid of this declaration in here because we don't want this scope fucking over our member variable. Now we put it in here. So we go int gb is equal to 255. And there you go. Bob's your uncle now in here. We're gonna set gb depending on whether uh, control is being pressed. And in here, we can access GB from compose frame and draw our shit depending on it. And that's great. One last thing. Here, we're still calling an input function from compose frame. We don't want to do that. We want to separate that shit out. So what we want to do instead is we'll go into here and let's just do a uh, bool change or uh, shape is changed and we'll set that initially equal to false so what this is going to do is this boolean is going to tell us whether the shape should change so we we assume the reticle is the default and the changed shape is the box now one thing i want you to note is that in the previous um in the previous homework i named this variable different i believe i named it shift is pressed but here I'm going to name it shape is changed because that's more reflective of what we're, the shift button is actually trying to accomplish. I just want you to know because the code that you see in the later tutorials, in tutorial 5 and 6 and maybe 7, might have a different name for this. But just don't get fucked over. Understand, please. So, what we're going to do now is we're going to move this call. So we're going to go if... And, uh, oh, actually, we don't have to do this. So this function returns a boolean value. Bool key is pressed. And all we have to do now is we just do, um, shape is changed is equal to windows dot, actually, I just paste. That's not a fucking paste. Control V. So this will return true if the key is pressed, which will mean that shape will be changed. So shape is changed if key is pressed. Just take this return value, jam it directly into the boolean. And then in here, we just test that boolean. So we go shape is changed. And now if we uh, build this and run it, hopefully we don't get any compiler errors. And now we can move our shit around the screen. Nothing should change in terms of the behavior of the program, but now you can see that our game logic is nicely separated from our drawing code. Very sexy. This is the way you should do it. All right, that's task one. Done. Let's go on to task two. Control the reticle velocity instead of movement. So what we want is we want to give the reticle a velocity and allow the reticle to move on its own with some velocity. Uh, so how are we going to do that? Well, first things first, we've got to create some more variables. So let's create some vari variables for the velocity of the rec rec reticle, which is basically the speed at which it moves and the direction. So we go VX 
that's the speed it's moving in the x direction and we'll set it initially to zero and vy and that's the speed it's moving in the y direction uh or the y axis initially zero and now what we want to do is we want to increase so now the the keys are going to be working on the velocity instead of on the uh, position so let's set the velocities or not set but adjust them depending on what keys are being pressed and we'll, we'll change that down to one because you'll see quickly but it it accelerates quite out of control so now here we're setting the velocity when we press the buttons and if we run that push the buttons we see that shit don't move why isn't it moving why do you think it isn't moving take a guess blues clues eh, the answer is um well we're we're changing the velocity but we're not actually moving the position of our reticle so now what we have to do at the end here is we have to update the position of the reticle so x is equal to x plus velocity x so now every frame it's going to add whatever the current velocity is to the x and we'll do the same for the y y is equal to y plus vy this will update the position of the reticle on the screen every frame we run the program we see the reticle isn't moving because the velocity is currently zero but tap a button and now you see it's drifting to the left. If I tap the right button, now it's drifting to the right. If I hold the right button, it accelerates really goddamn fast. And if you go up, we're fucking off the screen and shit's gonna pop off. So, break and stop. All right, so there you go. Now we can control, well, to a certain degree, we can control the velocity of our reticle and it will move automatically every frame across the screen depending on the velocity. So there we go. That's task two, fucking gonzo, out of here. That was, I didn't want to underline, I wanted to fucking strike through. There you go. Get the fuck out of here. Now, the third one is a little trickier. We want to prevent the reticle from balling out of control. So to understand why it balls out of control, you got to realize that if we touch the right button, we hold it down, it is going to increase the velocity by one every frame. So after holding it for one second, it's now going to be moving at 60 pixels per second. And that's just going to keep increasing. So instead of allowing it to increase every single frame, I got an idea. The idea is when we press the button down, and it processes update model, the first frame, it's going to detect that the button is being pressed. It's going to increase the velocity. But then the next frame, if we keep that button held down, we want it to not increase again. So the second frame, it should just do nothing. And it keep doing nothing until we release the button. And then if we press again, then it will increase the velocity by one again. So we want it to increase the velocity by a maximum of only one for every single individual press, not per frame. How do we accomplish this? Well, what we need is we need a variable to remember if we've already handled this key press. Uh, we need something to inhibit further uh, increases in the velocity until we release the key. So what we do is we're going to go bool inhibit up. We'll set this equal to false. And we're going to create inhibit variables for up, down, left, and right. All right, now that we've done that, we're going to go into here. And so the first thing we do is we check if window.keyboard.key is pressed. Then we check, are we inhibited? So if uh, inhibit right so if we are inhibited and the key is pressed do nothing don't worry about it otherwise if we are inhibited uh, if we're not inhibited and the key is pressed we want to increase the velocity and then set inhibit 
right equal to true. So the first time we enter in here, we're not going to be inhibited. So that means we're going to increase the velocity and set inhibit equal to true. Then the next frame we enter in here, inhibit will be true. So we just do nothing and exit until, until we release the key is pressed. So if key is pressed is false, then we want to reset our inhibitions. So we go inhibit right equal the false. You know, just drink some Jack Daniels or whatever. Get rid of that shit. Uh, let go. Get down with your bad self. And so forth. Um, so now we do this. And this should allow us now when we press the right key. It's only going to increase by one pixel per frame, the velocity, and it's not going to increase anymore. So I'm going to hold down the right key. And you can see now it's not balling out of control. Uh, if I hold down the left key, you see it balls out of control very quickly. So that works. And oh, one more thing I wanted to show you. So if I press the right key, it's not balling out of control. If I release and press again, now it's going faster, now it's going faster, and you get the idea. If I tap it really fast, you can see I can increase it a lot. But I can't increase it by just holding it down because we've got our inhibitor on here. So now I'm going to do this again for these other directions. So if you do that, it should now look something like this. We've got the left, down, and the up all inhibited. And if I run that shit, now I can hold the buttons down and they don't ball out of control. I can hit them multiple times to speed up and it's a little, it's a little easier to control. And that is our third challenge fucking roasted. And that'll about do it for tutorial four. Uh, we learned a, about a ton of shit in this video. We learned about animation and the game loop. We learned about the scope of variables. We learned about classes and objects and about header and source files. And the most important thing is we learned about adding member variables. And, you know, I didn't go into super depth in all these topics, but a lot of them, like classes and objects, we're going to be visiting these things again in more depth in the later tutorial, so don't worry about it. The main thing I want you to understand is how to add member variables to the game class and use them, and what the difference is between a member variable and a local variable in the function. If you understand that stuff, then you're good to go. Now, because we've done a whole bunch of coding already in part three, I'm not going to give you a homework assignment. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some questions up on the wiki page and you can go there and you can try to answer the questions yourself and then you can click to see the answers. Uh, so your homework is to do the assigned uh, questions on the wiki, basically. And another thing, one last thing that you have for homework is I'm going to be creating a bonus video to give you guys tips on how to succeed in learning programming because, you know, this is a remake of tutorial four. So I've seen you guys going through the tutorials now for quite some time. I've observed you like little ants under the microscope and I can see where you're going wrong and some advice I can give you that might help you to succeed where you may otherwise fail. So definitely look at the bonus video with the advice and also do the questions. The links to those things will be on the wiki as usual. My name is Chili and I'll see you soon with some more C++. Mm -hmm.